And I'm totally convinced, see, God could take away all the pain if he wanted to. He never does that. Like the doctor never does that. He don't want you to forget where you came from. And the pain is there for a reason. Acceptance doesn't change the way you feel. It changes the way you act. That's what happens when you accept something. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. From Studio A, deep in the heart of Texas, that was the voice once again of Mr. Reno John that you heard at the beginning of this episode, episode number 222, Dose, 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 222, and you are going to hear so much more from him, Mr. Reno John, in just a moment, but first things first, this episode right here, right now, is brought to you by Tanya and Kara and Marie and Anonwai Mouse, Anonymous, and what do you... And what, what do you think, or do or what you may ask, did Tanya and Kara and Marie and Anonymous do? Well, they went to our little website, SoberSpeak.com. They clicked on the little yellow donate tab, and they made a, a contribution. So thank you so much, Tanya and Kara and Marie and Anonymous. This episode is coming right out to you ones. I... John M., just another bozo on the bus, will indeed be the chairperson for this meeting between meetings, and I am truly honored and privileged to serve all of you listening in. So take a seat, if you will, around this virtual table, and let's get started. Remember now, four out of five sponsors surveyed. Recommend Sober Speak for your mental health and your spiritual well-being. What do I have going on this week? Ah, not much. Well, first of all, uh, I know we're well into the new year, but I hope everybody is having a prospero año uh, up to this point. And um, as uh, my friend Chad in the meeting always says, uh, This is the membership drive time for Alcoholics Anonymous and all the various addictions, most likely. But uh, anyway, that's halfway funny, halfway not funny. Uh, But uh, anyway, for those of you who are new to recovery, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, and the 12 Steps overall, Al-Anon possibly, and all the other uh, recovery groups, uh, we welcome you. Remember now, no matter what your past looks like, or um, anything else, you are welcome here. It is an open table for all, and we are glad that you have uh, joined us today. What else do I have? Oh, I have this uh, piece of uh, listener feedback right here at the beginning of the episode. I just loved this feedback that I got earlier this week. Uh, uh, Mary Lynn wrote in, and she wrote in, in regards to episode number 220, uh, it's by Rachel W., it's called uh, Don't Leave 
AA before the miracle happens. And she said, John, I just wanted to let you know, Rachel W's story hit me like a Mack truck. I'm sitting here right now, bawling my eyes out in my car. I'm going to send this to all of my sponsees, uh, John. It was absolutely incredible. It's exactly what I needed to hear. Thank you for your service. And once again, Mary Lynn is talking about episode number 220 with Rachel W. uh, And it's called Don't Leave Before, Don't Leave AA Before the Miracle Happens. If you haven't heard that one, I would go back a couple episodes from this and listen in. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I, I was bawling while I was interviewing her, uh, really getting caught up in that story. And, uh, Rachel W. It's just a great story. And if you all are out there and you're listening and you have any feedback regarding Rachel or any of the other speakers, please send me an email. I love to hear about it. Uh, John J O H N at soberspeak.com. Um, I would, I would just absolutely love to hear about any of the uh, speakers that you have heard that have uh, impacted you and in what ways. So, I uh, for work this week I uh, had to travel uh, outside of the United States, and because of that travel, uh, I had to go get uh, tested for COVID, and. Uh, on how did this go? On uh, Friday night, I ended up sitting in line for about two, two and a half hours because the testing was going crazy around here. People have to get tested for various reasons. Some just want to know. Some are traveling like me. Some anyway, there's all kinds of different reasons people are getting tested, right? So I waited in line for about two, two and a half hours, something like that, and I finally got it. And then like 24 hours later on a Saturday night, I found out that the test was inconclusive, is what they said. And I'm like, what? I didn't even know this was possible. What do you mean inconclusive? Just tell me I got it or I don't got it. That's really all I want to know. And I had to leave on Monday for my trip. So uh, I I, I raced around all that night trying to uh, find some place that was open, couldn't find any place. And then I went to another place that I had to go to on uh, Sunday and that line, uh, I say a line, it was, just, yeah, it was a line. You know, you're waiting in your car and that took about three, three and a half hours right in that area. So, and then they come back and then they say negative, but they say, we're going to give you a negative test, but that one that says inconclusive, that usually means you're a positive. And I would be very concerned, especially since you have been exposed lately and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, so what are you telling me here? I'm getting all kinds of mixed messages. And I don't know, the lovely Mrs. M went to the website and she researched it. And and it turned out when they, they come back, the I forget what it was called, actually, the inconclusive is actually a, a presumptive positive. And so I'm thinking, is this a false negative? I got all these positive negatives, negatives, positives. I'm going, what is going on here? So finally... I went over to another place that I had to go. Now, fortunately, this place was only an hour and a half. So right now I'm into, I don't know, I'm not adding this. I Seven, eight hours of sitting in line, getting tests and waiting for results and all this kind of stuff. And so finally they gave me a test and they came back later that night and they said it's negative. I said, hey, I'm going with this one. I'm leaving the country. And oh my goodness, it was just, just crazy. And then... When I'm out of the country, in order to get back into the United States, I don't know if you are aware of this, but you have to have a, a another COVID test that says it's been 24 hours now since uh, or, or within 24 hours of coming back. So the hotel there, they were very accommodating. They had it all set up and you go down into this room and um, here's what they tell you. <laughs> Me and a few other people were down there. They, they they take you into this room. They give you the COVID test. They say, now, go back to your room, wait for 20 minutes. And if the phone doesn't ring, you're good to go. But if the phone rings, we're going to tell you, stay in your room and you got COVID and you're going to be stuck here for the next 
four, five, six days, however long it may be. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. I just want to get back home. So anyway, it's interesting when you go back to your room, you just keep looking at that telephone and you're thinking, please, 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 please don't ring. Don't ring. Don't tell me I have COVID. And that was one of my fears of getting over there is that I was thinking, okay, is this going to be a a false negative. And then I get over there and it actually turns out I have it and I can't get back into the United States and I'm going to be stranded out of the country. And so I'm like, and it was a nice place, but, but still, you know, I just want to get back home. Um, and so anyway, I waited the, the 20 minutes and there was no ring. And I was thinking, is that it? Should I wait another five minutes? What, three or four minutes? I mean, can I get up and go walk around? What, what is the deal? <laughs> and then you're thinking, okay, what if they got busy? And then I started walking around the hotel and I saw a couple of other people that have been in there and they go, and I asked them, I go, were you just sitting in the room just looking at that phone the whole time thinking, don't ring, don't ring, don't ring, just trying to kind of distract yourself. I was doing work and all this kind of stuff. But anyway, I am one of the most tested people in the United States right now. Now, I believe for COVID, so all that went on. And then at the same time, in the same week, when I left town on that particular Monday, my daughter, my poor daughter, I, I don't know if you guys remember, but I told you uh, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks back now, we're like a month, right? A couple of weeks, three weeks, month. what are you going to do now, John, go into 2020? Just, just you, you know, slow down here on your weeks, but nonetheless, um, my son had gotten his wisdom teeth t taken out. And so my daughter got her wisdom teeth taken out on the same day. And that's part of the reason I wanted to get back because I wanted to be here with her and, you know, say, see how she was doing. And we thought, okay, first of all, she only had three wisdom teeth needed taken out. Now, I don't know where the fourth one went, but I was like, hey, do I get a discount since it's only three versus four? And apparently you do, but nonetheless, so they took out the three wisdom teeth and they were like little bitty short wisdom teeth. And my sons were like way down in there. So we thought, oh, well, hers is going to, this is going to be a piece of cake, right? Well, she is still not doing well. Looks like, and this is like Five days later now, uh, she she looks like she has she looks like a, a a chipmunk. Like her face is still so swollen, it's incredible. And I'm thinking, when is she going to come out of this? And the pain has not been good, and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, we're getting through it. Uh, it's like coming back into a mash unit. My son is sick too, and anyway, uh, such is life. Uh, but you know what? Here's the thing. I I, um, I sound probably like I am complaining, and I guess I am complaining, but I, I know in my heart of hearts that these are princess problems, if you will. Um, I'm fortunate enough to live in a place where there's all kinds of testing facilities around me, and I can get tested uh, pretty much any time of day or night if I want. And, uh, and, and, and I know my daughter is going to be okay. I know she's in some pain now, but we live in an area where we can go and have all this stuff done and, you know, have them well taken care of. And, you know, um, and, and I got a job that, you know, can, well, anyway, that is just real good to me. And, uh, I'm appreciative for everything that I have. And so anyway, um, that, that that is what's been going on in my in my life here uh this past week. So now on to the episode number two 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 here with Reno John live part dose. At the beginning of this here episode, you're going to hear Mary Lynn and Tony D sing a recovery song. They do an absolutely fantastic job. And then we'll get on into the interview with uh uh, uh, Reno John. And if you did not hear the episode with Reno John live part one last week, you want to go back and listen to not only Reno John's interview, but also the music from uh, Mary Lynn B and Tony D. And what they did at the beginning of the episode is absolutely fantastic. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you without further ado, here is Mr. Reno John at a live at our live event, and we will have plenty of listener feedback at the end of this episode, including a voicemail. Adios. 
So this is this is a, a song that I wrote. It's called Reach, and it was inspired by the 12th step, right, to go out there and reach and be positive and stuff. So Tony put his uh, little spin on it, so we're going to do it a little differently. Then I'm not even going to make a comment about what I'm not. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so this is called Reach, and this will be our last song. So let's let make Tony feel welcome tonight, yes? <laughs> Sitting on a park bench Middle of the afternoon, feeding the birds what was left of my bread. Something happened soon. Old man said, Excuse me, does this belong to you? Tossed me a shiny gold corn red. That on not for true, and it told me to reach. Try, believe. Some say he was an angel, others say he was a sign. Time has passed since I've seen his face, words still fill my mind. Sometimes when I'm lonely, fear fills my soul. Remember that little old man in the park, rub that car go reach, try, believe. It's by the side of the road. He asked me which way to go. And out on the corner of my eye, see that old man pass by. Him say, reach, try. And thank you, John, for letting us do this for you, for Sober Speak, and really looking forward to our speaker tonight. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right, John. So we talked about this a little bit on the podcast in the past, but can you explain what you believe the difference is between spirituality and religion? Yeah, well, you know, we're a, we're a spiritual program. And a lot of times I think that gets confused because I grew up and I was, I was really raised in the church. I, I did four years of seminary, you know? And uh, I think that's the best example I can think of. You know, in, in, in the Bible, in the Carpenter's Big Book, it says that it's life eternal to know God. Now, what they mean by life eternal is eternal joy, to know God. So we got to get to know God. And uh, the story's told about three guys that die to go to heaven. Meet St. Peter's at the pearly gate. You got one guy's a Christian, very strong Christian. One guy's a, a Jew. He's a Jewish boy. 
And the other guy's a drunk, alcoholic. So St. Peter says, welcome. We've been waiting for you. Figured you'd be here about now. I so said, decide where you're going to go. You need to go in here and be interviewed. This gentleman here is going to interview you one at a time. So first guy, go in here, and he'll interview you, and then he'll direct you to where to go. So guy walks into the room. The Christian goes first. Walks into the room. Walks up. And the man sitting behind the desk. The man says, oh, welcome, Chad. He said, listen, sit down. It's got just one question, really. One question I want to ask you. It's okay. He says, uh, who is God? He says, oh, well, God, you know, he created the world in six days, rest on the seventh day. First man and woman he created was Adam and Eve, and ran in the Garden of Eden, and then they kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and, and he went through that, and then he had Mo- Noah, and that big flood, and then Moses came along, took the children of Israel back to the promise. He went on for an hour. Then he got to the New Testament, talked about it, then he was, the son made flesh, and he turned, first miracle was turning water to wine, and he went on for another 20 minutes talking about the New Testament. The old man says, you really know your Bible. He says, I've been a student of the Bible my whole life. He says, well, great. He says, uh, I'm very impressed. We go to this door right here. You can go to that door right there. Guy goes through the door. Next guy comes in is the Jewish man. Comes over and he says, welcome. He said, just got one question for you. Who is God? Oh, he said, I know all about God. He said, I've been reading the Torah my whole life. He said, what happens is that uh, God created the world in, four day, in, in six days, rest on the seventh day, Adam and Eve, and they came along. And then, of course, the chosen people were the Israelites, and then they were held captive in Egypt for 247 years. Then Moses, the great deliverer, came along. Moses took them out back to the promised land. And uh, they had a lot of uh, prophets in the meantime. And he went through this whole thing. The first five books were written by Moses of the, New, of the Old Testament and went talk for an hour. Guy says, man, you know a lot about God. I've studied it my whole life. It shows. He's welcome. He says, this door right here. Same door. The Christian goes through the door. The drunk comes in, walks over, looks at the man sitting behind the desk, falls to his knees and says, my Lord, my God, There's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. And I think they told me a long time ago, if you want to get to know God, get to know his kids. You know, and that's where the 12th step program comes in. Religion does a wonder, and it's important. Learning about God is important to learning that, learning that stuff. I'm not downplaying that, but there's a big difference. Religion does a great job of teaching about God. Spirituality is getting to know God. And if you don't know him, you're not going to make it. And the way we, we, the way we do it in Alcoholics Anonymous is you get to know his kids by, doing, by being of service to them. Not only 12-step work, where you're going out talking to the wet drunk, but you do a great service. Don't need to, let's give him a round of applause. He does a wonderful job. You know? I get, I get emails from all around the world, from like New Zealand. I've never been to New Zealand. You know, that are... Or on his podcast, you know, that, that listens to us. I so. bet they're watching you right now in New Zealand, I, actually. <laughs> I take an airline ticket to New Zealand. <laughs> okay. Only kidding, only kidding. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> but I think, you're, you know, being of service to our, our fellow man is how you're going to get to know God, you know? The greatest, well, I'm, 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 I'll show you. That's, that's, that's my explanation. Spirituality is getting to know God. Religion is learning about God. So you have been sober for 40 years now, right? 40 years. That's fantastic. (laughs) What sort of changes have you seen in Alcoholics Anonymous over that 40 years? (laughs) There's There's been a lot. Uh, well, I tell you what, the most fascinating thing, I remember when I came in, this is in 81, and I was brand new, I'm going to my men's stag meeting, and the very first meeting they were having a thing, they were getting back, they were taking a survey and on a question they had, they were getting it to the GSR to take back to New York, to report back on it, and they wanted to know, this was the question back then, yeah, 1981, should we put out a pamphlet for the gay alcoholic? That was the question that they, they and this was a this was a debate like COVID. 
So we shut down and keep open. I mean, they were, well, why don't we just have a pamphlet for redheaded people then? <laughs> you know, if we're going to have, what's the difference between a gay guy and a straight guy? Let's just have, what about a redheaded guy? Let's get a pamphlet for a redheaded guy. What about a left handed guy? They were angry. They, 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 they don't need to put out a pamphlet for them. They're, they're alcoholic. We don't need a pamphlet for gay guys. Now we have a pamphlet for gay guys, you know? And I think that uh, probably uh, the biggest difference has become the age of people coming in. It used to be that the average age when the guy came into AA was 40, age 40. And so an old timer would have 20 years. He's, six, he's old, he's 60 years old, he's got 20 years. And uh, today, see there's a big debate over long timers and old timers. And we have guys, Casey's here. Mm-hmm. Casey got sober when he was 17. And, uh, and he's been sober 30, over 30 years. Well, come on, he's, you know, like 48. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but he's got 30 years sober. He's a long timer. You know, and so the big debate goes out of, you know, we got to change, change our term of long timer and old timer. I'm an old timer. I'm 70. And, uh, but I, f- I feel like a, a long timer. <laughs> But then my sponsor told me, he said, I tell you how, here's how you know whether you're an old timer or a long timer. Because we got a lot of, lot of long timers coming in now. The people when they're 17 and uh, 18 years old. And the difference is this if, if it's Saturday night and you're getting ready for bed about the same time you used to be getting ready to go out, <laughs> you're an old timer. <laughs> and if Sunday morning you're getting up about the same time you used to be getting in, <laughs> You are an old time. But the biggest telltale sign is this. If your drug of choice is Viagra, <laughs> you're an old timer. You know? that's, all there is. that's all there is to it. But that's the biggest change, I think. Because things come and go. And they told me AA is self-cleaning. And so, you know, we get a lot of stuff coming in and out of AA. But if we stay true to the, the uh, uh, traditions and the principles of alcoholics and mistakes, it'll be self-cleaning and they'll come and go. And, but the age difference is remarkable. I mean, it is, it is incredible. I couldn't get into a halfway house because I, I was 30 when I came in. And the guy at the halfway house said, no. He said, we get paid by the state for our success rate. And nobody stays sober under 40. So you can't come in. <laughs> oh. It's all changed today. Tell me that we were talking one time and you mentioned that you were on a committee that was going to uh, select speakers here in Texas and you had a little bit of a uh, difference of opinion about how to go about that. Do you remember what I'm talking about? No. But <laughs> no, but I, think, I think what you're saying is I do, I do recall that. But I, Here's what happened was... Don't leave me out to dry. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what happened was, we, uh, during the pandemic, I, I was going to Primary Purpose of Arlington, was my home group. The pandemic hit, and tempers got... Every, every group went through it, and so our group got divided, and uh, we ended up splitting up. And I, we started this is a group not called the story Back to I'm Basics. talking about at all. That's not what you're talking about. <laughs> no, you were you were on it was a it was there was a convention. Oh, and you oh, were on oh, the that. Oh, no. yeah, from a long time ago. Okay, at at Lone Star Roundup. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You should have said that. that I'm sorry. <laughs> it's my fault. It's the questioner's problem, not mine. <laughs> now, Lone Star Roundup. For those of you that are new, that was a great convention, Dallas, Texas. I mean, it was fun. It was fun. You get to see people you hadn't seen for a year, you know. And there'd be 4,000 people. At the end of it, there were 4,000 people. And I started out as an usher. I was new sober, and my sponsor got me down there. I was an usher. At that time, we had about, I think, 800 people over attending the meeting. It was still a big conference then. Then it kept growing and growing bigger and bigger. And I was an usher. I was an usher. And then they invited me because I, I was doing a lot of traveling and speaking. And so they said, why don't you be on our selection committee to uh, select speakers? I said, okay, I'll do that. And so our first meeting, now keep in mind, they had, Lone Star Roundup had a, uh, every year they would take one person who was the chairperson that year, had been a chairperson, and they'd move him to the committee and back of the committee. (laughs) They really ran the committees. 
And, and that was a lifetime position. And they, uh, they didn't tape. They were very traditional. They said, no, we can't tape the meeting. That would break the traditions. So no taping of the committee, you know. No taping of the, of the meeting. So we had all these great speakers come in and talk, and they never made a tape of any of the speakers. And so I'm there, I'm on, and the first meeting we had to pick speakers for next year's roundup, uh, there were six of us in there, and the chairman of the committee was a good friend of mine. And he passed out all these tapes. We each got like five tapes. He said, now take these tapes home and listen to them, and then bring your favorite one back, or your favorite two back, and then we'll take those two and we'll pass them around and come up with the speakers. And I said, Ron, wait a minute, wait a minute. You are asking us to listen to these tapes to decide who we're going to have speak at the convention. Yeah. And yet we don't allow tapers to tape. <laughs> Does anybody have a problem with that? And uh, he said, well, that's the way we're going to do it. And so then he called me up on Wednesday and said, uh, the committee's decided you'd probably be better served as an usher. <laughs> <laughs> so they, put me, they put me back as an usher. We had a long dis- we have questions coming in from Facebook. We don't have time. <laughs> Great. Okay. First from Anna Marie. And where is she from? Did she say? She did not say where she's from. Her question is, did you ever relapse? And what do you say to the alcoholic who has relapsed? Okay, I never relapsed. Uh, that's a gift, but I never, and I, I tell you what, it's a tough deal to do that in and out program. That's a hard way to get sober, you know? And we always say, keep coming back. And, uh, there may come a time when you don't come back, you know? And we, sometimes we say it's okay to relapse. We get that impression because we, we, we say, don't worry about it. Come, just come back. And that's all true. But, you know, you got to, you got to not drink. I don't care if your ass falls off. They said, pick it up and take it to a meeting. You don't drink. I don't care what happens. You don't drink. And I was so afraid of drinking that I didn't. Now, I will tell you this. I gained a great respect for those that do slip by when I was trying to quit smoking. And I'll make this real quick because I know. You're fine. But I had... uh, I was going to Trinity Group. It used to be a great group down off of just on the south side of LBJ and Inwood. And a 6 o'clock meeting was a great meeting at Trinity Group. And I was down there, and I was getting a 6 o'clock meeting. I'd go there after work, and I was pouring a cup of coffee. And uh, Lem was there. Lem was an old-timer. But this is back in the 80s. And Lem had 40 years back then. And the, the topic was the 11th step. And so I'm sitting there, sitting at my table. I'm smoking a cigarette. Love to smoke. And Lem said he had to watch his halt. It was 11th step. He said, I got to watch my halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And if, I have, if I'm not any of those, I have a better meditation. And I thought, I'll bet you if I didn't smoke, I'd have a better 11th step. I don't know where that came from, but that, that was what hit me. So I put on my cigarette, and I said, I'm going to go to the rest of the meeting and not smoke. Now, that was the third cigarette I'd smoked, and it was 6.30. So I, I, mean, I, I love to smoke. And uh, so I put out that cigarette and didn't smoke. Didn't tell anybody I was going to quit. I wasn't going to I was just I'm not going to smoke today. Went home, prayed not to have that compulsion. I carried him with me for a week. My wife finally said, you're not smoking. Are you quit smoking? I said, no, I'm just not. She said, no, don't tell me. You quit. So a week later, I'm back down at Trinity Group, and I'm pouring a cup of coffee before the meeting starts. And, and uh, Bob Hayes, you know, the bullet Bob, Fast man on earth, played for the Cowboys. He used to tend that meeting. He's dead now, so I can use his name. But uh, he came up and wanted to bum a cigarette, so I gave him the pack. And he said, no, I just want to take the pack. I got one in the car. So I gave him my last pack of cigarettes and didn't smoke. And it was the easiest thing in the world I'd done. I didn't have any compulsion, didn't have any desire, no withdrawal. It was very, very easy. Kevin, my friend Kevin, who I told you about the diet of the, uh, of the at 11 years sober, uh, he, as I said, was a freak on, phys- on his physique. He worked out a lot, and he was very good at watching his diet and everything. But every six weeks, he'd go down to Mexico. And when he went to Mexico, he would smoke, 
He did everything but drink alcohol. He would chase women, he would smoke, he would eat all the junk he wanted to, and then he would come home and, and not smoke. I said, how do you do that? How do you put out your cigarettes and not smoke? He said, I just set them on the dresser drawer when I leave the hotel and walk out and I'm, I'm done. I was luck would have it, 57 days without a cigarette, I'm in Mexico. And I thought to myself, I'm laying on the beach with my wife, I thought, I'll bet I can smoke in Mexico. <laughs> And so I went up, I went, excuse me, I went up to the room. She still smoked, and I, and I stole a couple of cigarettes out of, her, out of her pack and burned them real quick in the thing and went back down. And we got ready to leave, and I went home, and I thought, well, I'm done. That worked. I can smoke in Mexico. <laughs> and a couple of days later, I'm in the office working on a case, and a guy's smoking. I bummed a cigarette from him. Then I became a closet smoker, and it was just horrible, you know? And I finally came out of the closet. And... Uh, Smoking. I used to go in the closet, literally go in the closet and smoke. And she couldn't tell because she was a smoker. And it took me 14 years to quit. I tried everything under the sun to quit, and I could not quit. And I think what happens is God gives you a reprieve. And if you turn your back on that reprieve, man, it's hard. So those, you slip and slide, and I understand, man. I think you got a reprieve, and you, and you, you, you slip. And now it comes work. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to do something to, to not drink, you know? And I think that's what happens to those coming in and going out. It's, it's, a, it's a hard deal. And I feel bad for them. I'm glad it happened to me because it took me 14 years after I quit smoking to quit smoking. You know, I was almost 20 years sober when I quit smoking. Okay, we have a few other questions coming in. Would you like to know? Okay, next we have Jamie asking, what is the most important thing the newcomer should know? Don't drink. <laughs> you know, AA works a lot better if you don't drink. <laughs> it's not real good if you're drinking trying to work the 12 steps. Nothing worse than a head full of AA and a bully full, belly full of beer. You know? And the most important thing is, is, is to don't drink. And now how you do that is, what, is what's going to be tough. Because you're going to have to... You're going to have to get you a sponsor, and you're going to have to stay in touch. Get in the middle of, pro, get in the middle of AA. Most, I think the most important thing you can do is, is get in touch with a sponsor and follow what they tell you to do. You know? Okay. Yeah. James is asking, I'm curious about what John's experience is with Step 10. What, it, what about Step 10? Yes, Step 10. And what's the question about Step 10? Just your experience with oh, it. Oh, my experience. <laughs> I spend one whole hour doing the steps on step 10. How much time do we have? We got, we, not an hour, <laughs> no. but we got a few I think, I think step 10, I think somehow what happens is, and this happens to everybody I know, everybody I know, sometime between uh, five years and 10 years, I think what happens is you become the ash you really are. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I think that... You know, we come into AA, and we're, we're real active. You know, we're going to meetings. We're writing inventories. We're keeping a journal. We're calling our sponsor. We're chairing meetings. And all that activity, we're way up here, you know? And, and the disease is down here. And we have a big gap between all that activity that we're doing to stay sober and the disease. And we're pretty safe. And then a couple of years go by, and all of a sudden, you, think, you know, you get a job. And my gosh, and then, and then you get a relationship going. And then you think, you know what, I'm supposed to fit back into society. I'm supposed to learn how to learn how to live in society. So I don't need to go to a meeting every day. I've been going to two meetings a day. I can go to three meetings. I go Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Go to me, and then Sunday, maybe. And so we start cutting back on our meetings a little bit. And then I don't need to call my sponsor every day. I've worked the steps, you know. I'll call him when I got a problem. And so what happens is the disease is progressive. Even though we're not drinking, it's progressing. That's why people with long-term sobriety, when they go out, die real quick. Because they don't start where they left off. They start 20 years later, wherever they, how long have they been sober. And so what happens is the disease is progressing, and here's our program, and we're cutting back. And the disease is growing. And at some point in time, and usually somewhere between 5 and 10 years, the disease catches us. And we wake up in more pain than we ever dreamed possible. You know, and uh, and I think what happens is then we start to think, well, I've worked the steps, 
you know, I've, I've sponsored people. I've done this and that. There's got to be something else. And so we go to alternative therapies to relieve the pain. And you see that a lot with, with guys. They'll start doing some, some counseling. I'm not opposed to that. But I think that what happens is, is you got to get back to basics. That's the name of our home group. It's back to basics. And start doing, doing what you did when you first came in, you know. Uh, and step 10 is when you, do, when you take step 10, you review the first nine steps. Okay? What happens is it says, continue to take personal inventory. Well, before you can take a personal inventory, you've got to take steps one, two, and three, right? Then you take your personal inventory, which is step four. When you're done with that, you've got to tell somebody about it, which is step five. And then you've got to change that behavior in six and seven so that you can, when wrong, promptly admit it. You make amends. When wrong, promptly admit it. So when you take step 10, you have effectively redone the first nine steps. So you don't get too far off the beam in one day. You don't get too far off the beam in a week. They'll go a year without doing that review, and you're, you're way off the beam, you know? And I think step 10 is what keeps us on track, and it keeps us doing what we're doing. If I, if I, every time I got in trouble, and I've called my sponsor and met with him, and uh, the greatest point was when I was eight years sober, and I was in a ton of pain, I met with him on over everything, he, sh- he, always, he, he does the same thing every time, and I hate it when he does this. I hate it when he does this. And a lot of you know Jim. He always looks at me, and he shakes his head, and he says, I got no magic. I hate that. Because <laughs> I want magic. <laughs> I want him to give me the magic word that's going to take that pain away, you know, and make it okay so that I don't, I don't feel that way. And, uh, and going through that pain, now here's what I learned by that. Uh, I learned what acceptance is all about. See, if physical damage, if I, if I break my leg, physical damage is pretty easy for the doctor to examine, diagnose, and treat. And they can tell you how long it'll be for your leg mends. It's going to be six, eight weeks, whatever time it's going to be for the leg mends. You're in the hospital, and uh, you come in to see me. What are you going to say? You're going to say, hey, slow down. Take it easy. You know, you need something, let us know. We'll get it for you. And the doctors, they give you some pain medication, take away the pain. They could give you enough to take away all the pain. They never do that. They don't do that. Because they don't want you to forget you got a broken leg and get up and re-injure yourself. So they give you enough pain medicine to take away, to make the pain bearable. So you don't get up and re-injure yourself. And I think emotional, spiritual, and psychological pain is much tougher to diagnose and much tougher to know when it's going to be over. You know, How long, what I got to do to get through this? You know, and we see a guy come into AA and he's, man, he, his wife left him. He's lost his house, had his car repossessed, and they fired him at work. And we say, hey, accept it. You know, you're going to have to accept the fact of where you are right now. Get on, get on with your life. Grow up. You know, grow up. Put, put, your, put your boots on and get, get busy working, you know. I used to think that acceptance, if I accepted something, that it wouldn't, the pain would go away. You know, when I got divorced, I thought, man, if I accept that divorce, then I'll be okay. You know, the pain, it won't hurt. It won't hurt anymore. I am totally convinced, see, God could take away all the pain if he wanted to. He never does that. Like the doctor never does that. He don't want you to forget where you came from. And the pain is there for a reason. Acceptance doesn't change the way you feel. It changes the way you act. That's what happens when you accept something. When doctor, when you got sober, what happened? Did you still have a desire to drink? Some of us did. Dr. Bob had a desire for two years to drink. But it changes the way we act. Our actions change, and eventually our feelings will change. So we change our actions, not our feelings. So when I accepted that divorce then you can stop those, uh, you know, those drive-by location checks. You know? We just drive by to make sure they're at home on Friday night. Right? <laughs> Remember those telephone calls you used to make before caller ID? <laughs> caller ID. You'd call them on the phone late Friday night, see if they're home. they pick up the phone, hang up. 
And they, wait a minute, wait, what's she doing home Friday night? I got to drive by, see what, see if any strange, <laughs> strange cars in the parking lot. So if you accept that, then you can quit that activity. You can change your activity and you eventually get well, you know? And I had, I was going through that divorce and I was at a Christmas party and I was, Harry knows, Harry came and drugged me out of my house because I was isolated. I was hiding in the house. But I went to this birthday party, or Christmas party, and a guy used to do the steps. He's passed on now. I won't tell you his name, but he's a good friend, was a good friend. And I was talking, he was at his house, big house, North Dallas. And he said, how long are you guys married? And I said, seven years. And he said, oh, it's going to take you three years to get through that. I said, three years? Said, yeah, three years. Three years to get over that, over that marriage. Next day, I talked to my sponsor, and I said, hey, he told me it's going to take me three years to get through that divorce go over that divorce. And Puckett shook his head. And he says, John, he said, let me tell you, I, I got a lot of confidence in you. I believe if you work hard at it, you can stretch that out to five years. <laughs> 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 and then he said, why would you limit God's ability to make you well? It's activity you're going to change that will change the way you feel. And so I think acceptance and step 10, I learned, you learn a lot about pain in step 10 because you're going to have to change a lot of activity what you're doing, because I tell you what, the, the disease will catch you in this program. And you're going to wake up in a lot of pain, and you're going to have to go through that process of accepting what's, what's going on and getting back to the basics. So, three questions out of the way. Are there any more, sir? Yes. Lorraine, Lorraine is asking, what do you think makes a good sponsor? Someone that loves you enough to tell you the truth is not afraid of hurting your feelings, and has worked the steps, and tries to get you, and, and doesn't, and helps you work the steps. We are not financial counselors. We are not marriage counselors. We only help people work the steps. And when I get outside of that realm, uh, I get in all kinds of trouble, all kinds of trouble. And I, I've, and I've messed up a lot on that. I had a guy, I had a guy I was sponsoring that, uh, he, he had a lot of problems. And, uh, good looking guy. I mean, he was a model guy. He looked like, he looked like he could have been on, on covers of magazines. He was a handsome, handsome guy. I never had, dating was... a beautiful girl. And uh, he was weird. The guy was sick. And, uh, I want to tell you about his fifth step. I listened to his fifth step, and it was sick. And he told me, we were talking, and, and his girlfriend had, had uh, dropped him because he hit her and broke her eardrum. And she came back. And I said, don't. And I, I got outside my bounds. I was wrong. I said, I said, give her a break. Let her go. Don't take her back. I said, she's as sick as you are. You're sick, and she's sicker than you because she came back to you. There's not a healthy woman out there that stay with you. You hit them like that? See, we, they, we get to be like boiling frogs. You know how you boil frogs? You put a frog in a boiling water, it jumps out real quick. Reflex too fast. Can't cook a frog that way. You got to put him in a pool of boiling, of, of cool water. It's cool. Frog likes it. He swims around likes it. Then you turn the heat up. It gets a little hot in there. Frog says it's getting hot. But it's not that bad. Turn up a little more. It gets a little hotter. Frog says, man, it's getting really hot in here. But it's not that bad. Pretty soon as the water's boiling, he can't get out. It's cooked. And that's what happens to a lot of us. And that's how alcoholism works. If my f last drunk if my first drunk would have been like my last drunk, I'd have quit. But it wasn't that bad, you know? And we get into relationships the same way, whether it be a, a spousal abuse, whether it be a man or a woman, it ain't that bad, you know? And I told the guy, I said, let her go. Do her a break. She can't leave you. She's as sick as you are, if not sicker. He told her that. And uh, I was wrong. I had to make amends to him. I had no business getting involved in that. But uh, so... Make sure they, they stay to the program and don't go outside the program, and that's what makes a good sponsor. Someone that loves you to stand on your toes and tell you the truth, but stay in the program. Don't, don't go out there trying to be a financial counselor or a marriage counselor or a 
emotional counselor, you know. Okay, now Mandy is asking, do you speak to young adults and teenagers about alcoholism? Any advice there? Yeah, I, th- the, the, I think that, as I said earlier, that the young people are coming in at an alarming rate, and that's good. And a lot of they say it's because of drugs. Drugs get here quicker, you know? And, uh, and so I think that with the young people coming in, I think that the disease is the disease is the disease. And it's like me sponsor. I sponsored it years ago. I, uh, I sponsored a transvestite. And I thought about that. I said, how do I write to this guy? You know, I don't, I'm, but it was fine, you know, because I stated the, the solution of the disease. And I think when you work with young people, they got a lot of things. I, First guy I sponsored that stayed sober, his name was Wally. Wally was 20 years sober when he came in, and he's still sober today. He lives out in San Diego. And uh, his fist step was the most boring thing I ever heard in my life. You know, nothing, no action. It just, <laughs> I broke some windows at school. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I wanted some juicy stuff, nothing there, you know. But we stated the program of what you need to do in the program. And if you do that, doesn't matter how old they are. The, the disease is the disease is the disease. And there are a lot of meetings out there now that are, that are catered to young people. Uh, whiskey and milk is a great meeting, I hear. So uh, there's a lot of things you can do. But I think that we've got to welcome the young people in. They don't have to go through what we've gone through. And there's a lot of people that, uh, like Casey that's here, that got sober when they were 17, that have got a lot of time sober now that can help them. Okay, great. When, one more from Facebook. Dan G. from San Jose is asking, can you please share your experience of how you work step 11 in your daily life? I think that step 11, I got to share this. This is, a, this is a funny story. When I was, when I was married to Lisa, and uh, these women were over talking at, at the house, and this one gal, I won't tell you her name, because she's still sober today. She got a lot of time sober. And we're all young back then. And she said, you know, I go to these step speaker meetings. And these guys in these step speakers are talking about how at night before they go to bed, they do this and this and this. And then in the morning they get up, they do this and this. She said, I want to tell you something. I've slept with half of those guys. None of them do that. (laughs) 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 I got to kick it. And then she's like, can't wait till I get to be an old timer and I can share that. (laughs) So every time I say, say, you're going to share that? No, I'm not sharing that ever. And you better not either. So I... I share it, but I don't tell who said it. Uh, so I think step 11 is, and I want to make this brief. Step 11 is very, very key to getting to know God. And I think for me to clear my mind, I can't do that. I have to give my mind something to think about. And the purpose of that step is to enable you to increase your conscious contact with your higher power. So when I first started, I used to think about how I got here. And, and I'd tra- take it backwards to see how God would work my life to get me to where I am today, you know, whatever that problem was. Like, how did I get to Dallas? What am I doing in Dallas? I didn't know I'd be in Dallas. I grew up out in the West. Why did I end up in Dallas? And I traced that back, and I found out I started in Dallas 10 years before I got here. I didn't know that, you know? But there was a reason why I'm here. And, and when I came to Dallas, for a very specific reason, I came here because I got my sponsor here. They helped me work my third step. I got... Married here. I got back in the insurance business here. My whole life fell together in Dallas. I'm supposed to be in Dallas, and I know that now. And that came through meditation by looking back at how I got here. And I think you can do that with everything. How did I get married? Why did I marry that gal? See, I have spiritual myopia. I'm nearsighted spiritually. I have no idea how what is going on today is going to affect me 10 years from now. And I have no idea what happened 10 years ago that affects me today. Meditation helps me put that in perspective. And so I look at how I got here, and I, I still do that today, how I got to this. And I find out that, man, God has been involved in our lives forever in very small, minute ways to get you to where you are today. And if you'll take that, and that's the way I, because I, I can't clear my mind and let God move in there, you know. I have to give my mind something to think about. And the purpose is to increase my conscious contact with my higher power. So I go back and say, how did I get to Dallas I traced it back, and I found out it's my sister that got me here. And, uh, and it's an incredible experience. So I think 
To this day, I still do that. How did I get, how did I get involved in, in that business? How did I get involved in that? And uh, you trace, trace it back and you see where God got involved in your life years ago. Years ago. That's how I, that's how I meditate. All right, so John, I want to ask you one last question. It's actually, I want to ask you to share your experience, strength and hope regarding a particular, we did an episode called uh, Expect a Miracle, and we talked about all kinds of miracles that you had experienced in your life. I'd like you to share about the experience that you had with your father and when he was passing, when you were in Hawaii, and that particular experience, and share that with the audience, please. Okay. You know, we have that expect a miracle thing a lot, and, uh, and I do. We, we, we depend on them. Uh, and the thing, when we start talking about miracles, we usually only talk about one part of the miracle, and that's God's part. But there are two parts to every miracle. And the best example of that is the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, right? And the children of Israel have held captive down in Egypt, for 247 years. A lot of people didn't know that. I know that. So if Moses is going to come along and take him back to the promised land, right? Y'all see that movie? I know you didn't read the book. <laughs> <laughs> so Moses taking him back to Egypt. They can stop at the Red Sea. They don't know how to cross the Red Sea. They're talking about it. We're going to debate about it. They don't know how to cross the Red Sea. And then God parts the Red Sea, right? And uh, that's God's part of the miracle. That's only half the part, half the miracle. The children of Israel had to walk through the Red Sea. You gotta walk through the Red Sea. If they don't walk through the Red Sea, some of them didn't want to go. Some of them said, oh, hell no, I'm not walking through there. You know, I'd rather go back to Egypt. Let's ask them if we can come back. I'd rather be a slave than walk through that. You know? In sobriety, you're gonna have to walk through your own Red Sea. If you don't do that, there's no miracle. You're gonna shortcut God's, because God, God can't make you walk through the, through the Red Sea. And you're all going to have your own red sea to walk through. And what he's talking about is, is uh, I mean, I'm speaking at the AA convention in the Hawaii State Convention. And I'm over there, and it's a great time. And Friday morning, I get a phone call, and my dad died. And so uh, I went to the committee, and I said, my dad's passed away, and I got to go home. And they said, can you spend the night? And said, you, well, I was going to speak Saturday. They said, well, have you speak tonight instead of Saturday night? And I said, yeah. So I spoke Saturday night, caught a plane. Uh, I spoke Friday night, caught a plane Saturday, and had to come a funny way. I had to fly from Hawaii to, to San Francisco. I had like an eight-hour, five-hour layover in San Francisco. Flew down to Dallas, had a three-hour layover in Dallas. Down to Houston, had a two-hour layover in Houston. And then back to Salt Lake. My dad lived in Salt Lake. It took me 24 hours to get there. And I, we buried my dad. I got there sun, Sunday. We buried my dad Monday. And uh, things were great. And my son took me to the airport Tuesday. I had to go back to Dallas. And I'm at the airport. First time I'd been alone. Really, first time I'd been alone. And I was tired. That was a rugged trip. And I was hungry and I was angry. I started to get angry. Wasn't angry to start with, but I started thinking about what was I doing in Hawaii? I shouldn't have been in Hawaii. The good son would have been in Utah with his mom. My dad had a heart attack two months prior to that. And the good son would have been in Hawaii, been, been in Utah with his mom. I had no business being in Hawaii. This is just ego. Going to these conventions is just ego stuff. I should have been with my mom in this hour of need. I called my dad. He had a heart attack two months prior to that. And I called him Tuesday before we left. And they said, yeah, he's doing better. Go ahead and go. But the good son would have been there. I shouldn't have been there. I just really started beating myself up sitting at the airport and thinking, this is be it. I'm never going to go to another conference. That's just ego. I should have been with my dad when he died. And there came, in the middle of all that, when my mind really started to beat me up, there came a page over the intercom, and the page said, would a friend of Bill W. pick up the white paging phone? <laughs> I started laughing, too. I said, he, thinks he needs the 12-step call. So I picked up the phone. There's a guy from Chicago. We met down at the coffee shop, and his dad had died a year prior to that. And we had a great talk, and, and I said... Uh, I never heard a page for Bill W. at the airport in my life. I said, you paged a lot of Bill Dub friends of Bill W. at the airport? He said, never done it before. I just want to see if any drunks in Utah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I never heard of a page like that before at the airport. Yeah. 
That's just a coincidence, isn't it? God ain't going to do that. He's not going to have that guy call, put out a page. You know, what that told me was I was right where I was supposed to. My dad was going to die anyway. We had made amends and things were fine. My brother was there. My sister was there. So my mom was not alone. I was where I was supposed to be talking to my kids, talking to God's kids, you know. And uh, that one was for me because God's going to put just the right person at just the right time with just the right information. Because God works through people. Don't forget that. He works through people. And we got to pay attention to who's, who's calling. And we never know those things until after the fact. I never thought about that until a week later when I was meditating on how did that happen. And I realized that what God had done. And all those miracles that happen in our lives on a daily basis, God's putting just the right person at just the right time with just the right information. And it goes on and on and on all the time. And we just have to be aware of it and pay attention to what's, what God's doing for us. So as we wrap up here, John, what do you want to leave the folks here with that are actually in the audience, the folks who are watching you on the uh, Facebook live stream, and also the people that will be listening to you on the uh, podcast eventually? What are some final thoughts you want to leave us with? I don't know. I, I'll make it real quick because of the matter. Uh, you know, the book talks about the spiritual toolbox. We have a spiritual toolbox of these tools. And I think that's very important to think about it as a toolbox. Now, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? So we got to have this toolbox full of these tools. And uh, the big book is one tool. In fact, each page of the big book is a different tool. The steps are a tool. Your sponsor is not a tool. <laughs> Okay, your sponsor is the is the guy that's going to tell you which tool to use. You don't know which tool to use. You don't know what the problem is. You know, your sponsor is going to tell you which tool to pick up until you get until you have enough experience to realize what 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 you're doing. And I think probably I've thought a lot about this: the difference between something that's complicated, complex, and simple, and they're all related. It's amazing. This came out of meditation. Best way to examine that is, it used to be years ago, you young people know this, they used to print maps on paper. <laughs> and they would take these maps and they'd put them in a book. It was called Mapsco. <laughs> and every outside salesperson had a book of maps. He'd go down the map, you'd go down to the store and buy a Mapsco. And then they, and this was complicated stuff because you would have to find, the day before your appointments, the next day you'd look up the appointment, the address, you'd go to the back of the page of the index, find that street, and it had numbers on it. They were in on the top of the page and the side of the page, and you'd find those numbers, and where they intersect was the, where the street was. Now this gets complicated because now you've got to work back and see, okay, how do I get to that street? So you've got to trace it back. This is hard stuff. <laughs> Take you an hour to find an address this way, you know? It's complicated. Today, I have a cell phone. It's very complex. Very complex. I don't, it's got thousands. That app, GPS, has thousands and thousands of lines of code. It's very complex. I don't understand it. I don't even know what an algorithm is, you know? (laughs) But it's very simple to use. You just have to pull it out, punch it, and then hit... You don't have to type in the address. You hit the microphone and speak the address into it. (laughs) And then it pulls it up. And then you just have to follow directions. It's that simple. You just have to follow the directions. And you know, alcoholics argue with GPS. I do it all the time. (laughs) What the hell she got me going that way for? (laughs) That's insane. I don't need to do that. I'm going to go this way. But see, the GPS knows things I don't know. They know that there's a traffic jam down there. They know that there's road construction. There's an accident. I just have to follow directions. And that's the way the program works. It's very complex. But it's very simple because all you have to do is follow the directions. I don't understand it. Why do I got to write an inventory? What the hell is that all about? That's between me and God, not you. I'm not going to tell you about it. Why do I got to do that? I don't need to do that. I call my sponsor. got a major problem in the morning. My sponsor says, okay, before we get started, did you make your bed? What? got a problem here. Yeah, I know you do. We'll get to it. Did you make your bed? <laughs> no? No, not yet. Okay, make it. Call me when you're done. Why? Why do I got to do that? 
make my bed. Come on. Okay, my bed's made. Okay. Uh, one thing I forgot to ask you. I'm sorry. Have you vacuumed? How long has it been since you vacuumed? <laughs> Haven't vacuumed for a week. Well, vacuum, come when you're done. Come, okay, I'm, I'm ready. To, no, I'm sorry. Last time I saw you in your car, your car looked drunk. Okay? It looked drunk. You're using the back seat as garbage. I want you to clean that out, wash your car, vacuum it, and call me when you're done. <laughs> Why? Okay, just do it. I'll call. Me. Finally, okay, I'm done. Okay, I'll tell you what. Meet me at the group, and we'll talk about it after the meeting. Go to the meeting. Ponce woman says, so what's going on? Nothing. Why? <laughs> well, you, you, you called me. You were nuts. Oh, yeah, yeah. If I think about it, I'll call you back. You know? <laughs> There are a lot of stuff we don't know what's going on. You don't need to know. You just need to follow directions. And if you do that, your life's going to get a whole lot simpler. Everybody, Reno John, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Very good job. Thank you. <laughs> Reno John, if you are listening to this, thank you so much. So, so much. Once again, for taking time out of your schedule, spending an evening with not only me, but all of the rest of the people on Zoom, not Zoom, but Facebook Live, and all of the audience members that evening, I, I, I so much appreciate you. Uh, it was just absolutely fantastic. And once again, shout out to all the volunteers and all the church personnel that ha- helped put this thing on, and also Mary Lynn B. and Tony D. for their for, for for the songs that they perform there, just add a wonderful vibe to the evening. Um, I so, so much appreciate you all, uh, everybody who had something to do with this one. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll do one of these things again here coming up in the near future. I have nothing planned at this time. Uh, it takes a little bit of work to put all that together, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to do something in the uh, uh, near future. Now, on to a little bit of listener feedback. And we have a treat here on the beginning of this from Marie T. Hey, that kind of rhymes, doesn't it? Marie T on a, left a voicemail here on the front end. So here is Marie. Hey, John, this is Marie T from uh, Fort Myers, Florida. I just want you to know that I just heard Marty C. Um, and I love the guy. I see him at PPG Austin as well. And I also want to thank you so much for the work you're doing in, in uh, allowing me, a drunk like me, to um, hear somebody as wonderful as Marty C. And the rest of the speakers that you have on here. What a service you're doing to the alcohol for the alcoholic. I'm just so damn excited. I can't stand myself. Um, I love AA. <laughs> I love AA and God, it works. It works. It really does. And God is good and all those cliches. And I'm like Marty, the more sober I am, the more so, the more excited I get about this program more and more. Anyway, John, it was good talking to you and uh, see you on the firing line. Marie, thank you so much. And I love that. See you on the firing line. I love that you mentioned Marty C. Yes, I love Marty C as well. And uh, uh, gosh, what a... What a privilege it is to have guys like Marty C and Reno John and Rachel, who we were talking about earlier, all these people uh, to be on the podcast. And I just feel so uh, blessed. And, uh, you know, Marie, I'm like you. I, uh, I've i been sober a little bit uh, for a little while, and I also am excited. I think I'm more excited about it now than I was in the beginning. And, and I don't mean, well, let me put it this way. When I first got sober... Am I more excited? I'm just excited in a different way. It's kind of more of a, uh, cause I was pretty excited when I first got sober. Um, and you know, for people who are listening to this, who have not been in AA for a while, they probably wonder what, what is going on with these people? Have they drunk the Kool-Aid and they just are living on some, in some sort of alternative universe or something? And that's not it, right? And I think Marie would agree that 
You know, it's just, it's, it's so rewarding to come in and see newcomers get well. It's so rewarding to see what, um, AA has provided me over the years. And, and, and it's just something that you can't put in words. Like the book says, it is an experience you must not miss. And, and, and that's just my personal experience, right? I love it. There's probably, I, in fact, I know there are people who have come to Alcoholics Anonymous and they don't see it in the same way. And that's okay. But that is the experience for me and Marty and Marie and scores of, of others. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm very grateful that, that Alcoholics Anonymous has that I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that Alcoholics Anonymous has provided me a way of life and it provided me a way out of that existence that I was living there for so, so many years. So anyway, Marie, thank you so much for uh, calling in. Kelly writes in and Kelly says, thank you for these pod beans. <laughs> and I'm assuming what Kelly means, there is an app. In fact, it's our hosting service that we use. It's called Podbean. Uh, and, and you can use that as a player to listen to the podcast. Uh, it's much like you can use Apple Podcast or any other player that you have. But anyway, she says, thank you for these pod, pod beans. My sponsee is in jail and it is really making a difference. They give tablets apparently in jail now. I just wanted to drop you a note from good old St. Louis, Missouri. Well, you know what? We've had Emily on our show before, and Emily is from St. Louis Mo as well. wonder if you guys know each other. I know it's a big city, but nonetheless, that is really good news, Kelly, and you probably sent that in because I was asking on a previous uh, episode whether or w- what the protocol is uh, for folks who are incarcerated nowadays. Do they get access to internet and can they listen to the podcast and can they listen to other podcasts and can they get they get, can they get access to other resources besides mine that can help them and apparently they do. And so th- anyway, Kelly, thank you so much for writing in from St. Louis Mo. Adrian writes in, uh, and Adrian is from Germany, says, hello, John M. I hope that everything is fine with you and you had a nice winter holiday. Just a small question. He says, are there any AA groups from your area online in Zoom? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. And he says, I've never been in an American AA meeting, and it will be an experience for me considering that AA has as its root in the United States of America. Thanks and best regards, Adrian. So, okay, and I'm going to read this next one here because it's, it's very similar. Kristen wrote in and she says, Dear John, I listen to your podcast all the time and I enjoy it. I am living in Buenos Aires and I was hoping that you could give me a Zoom code and password for a step meeting in your area. I especially like the speakers from your area in Texas. I would really appreciate any information you could give me and not take up too much of your time. It's okay. Uh, Service in AA, Kristen P. from Buenos Aires. In fact, it says, I think this is a telephone number here. And then it says in quotes, Bayela Como Sos. And I'm sure I am bastardizing that. B-A-I-L-A Como uh, SOS, S-O-S. So I don't know what that means. It could mean go pound sand, John. <laughs> it's probably not go pound sand. Uh, it's probably, it's probably something really nice, but who knows? It, it could, it could be. But anyway, I wanted to address both of those particular, uh, 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 emails, uh, the one from Adrian and the one from Kristen. So I don't 
live in the Zoom world very much, but I want, but, but I reached out to a good friend, Sarah R., who attends my home group. Uh, she's absolutely wonderful. And, and, and I responded and copied Sarah on it for both of you. And Sarah is much more versed in the Zoom world than I am. Now, here's another suggestion. And Sarah w- replied back, and thank you so much, Sarah, for your service work and, and getting with Adrian and Kristen and, and guiding them in the right direction. But here's what I, here's what I would say. Probably the best way to go about, I know that there's tons of Zoom meetings, right? And and I know some of you want to go to Zoom meetings that are like in my area, but yeah, I don't really know if it really matters if in the Texas area they are there. Oh, I just thought about something. Charlie P has a Wednesday night Zoom meeting that he does uh, every Wednesday night with a, with uh, every Wednesday night with a with the primary purpose group and I should get back to you guys with that. But nonetheless, I'm thinking on the fly here, but here's another way you can go about that little request. If you're in the super secret Facebook group and if you're not, by the way, just go to the Facebook, find a uh, search for Sober Speak Secret Group and ask for admission and we will get you on in there. Um, And if you're in there, you can post this question in there. I can guarantee you there are tons of people in there know a lot more about Zoom than I do, uh, and they can help you as well. So hopefully that answers your question between me and Sarah R. and go on into the Facebook group and post your question in there. Hopefully you can find what you're looking for. And lastly, but not leastly, Kim D writes in and she says, hi, John, I live in Denton. Denton, by the way, is just down the street from me. It's a, it's within a a shouting distance, if you will. She says, I lived in in Denton and I just celebrated five years in December. My home group is the show me group in Denton. I've never been there. I don't think to the show me group. I've heard of it. A lot of people I know attend there. I did go to a group in Denton for a while, Kim D and I can't remember. It's on the very North side of Denton. I think they've moved facilities and there's a, a, a gentleman that I used to love there. His name was OC, his OC, OC, I E. Some of you may know him. He's gone to the big meeting in the sky now, but nonetheless, uh, she says my, favorite speakers are Jennifer HK and Charlie P. And I look forward to hearing from Katie P soon. Thanks to the ad in the Facebook group. Well, you are quite welcome, uh, Miss Kim D. And yes, we will be having Katie P very soon. I got her in the queue. Just got to get the uh, episodes released, edited, released, all that kind of good stuff. And anyway, that's it. Thanks for writing in, Kim D. That does is another week, uno mas semana of Sober Speak on this here episode number 222, dos, dos, dos. We take this one week at a time, everybody. Hopefully I will be back next week. Uh, God bless you all. Keep coming back. It works if you work it and uh, have a good rest of your week. Adios.